a, a, a deep statement right there, isn't it? Yeah. And though you slay me, I will trust you, Lord. What a what a what a deep uh, uh, statement. Not not only to just say it's easy to say things, right? But to live that out is is incredibly deep. I just want to thank you guys for coming. Uh, I want to thank you guys for being a part of uh, this church, this community, the little things that we do, like the love dares and meet and greet and community groups. We love it. And uh, at the end of every summer, like you guys have, we've, we've kind of been sharing with you, uh, we do a thing called family-style worship where we have all of the kids and all of the adults and everybody together come in here. And so they're here again this week or last week. Next, next week, we'll be starting our children's ministry again. So something to look forward to. If you're in fifth or sixth grade, we actually have a new class. So lots of exciting things happening. And we're also starting a new series and the series is called The Good Life. The Good Life. Now, if I was coming to a church and I saw that they were doing a new series called The Good Life, I might be tempted to go, oh, great. Now we're going to get into one of, become one of those fluffy, like, you know, like feel-good type churches. Um, you know, that this would be like seven steps to how to be awesome or seven <laughs> steps to how to have no problems or seven steps to be real cool or something like that. Be a hipster, seven steps. Maybe there's eight, I don't know, maybe there's six. Who cares? I'm a hipster, I don't care about something like that. Right? Maybe it's like that. I just want to tell you right now that this series is going to be the exact opposite of that. We're not going there. Uh, what we like to do is we like to teach the Bible and we teach... Uh, books of the Bible, we teach chapters of the Bible, like we just got done with one, and we're going to teach a passage of the Bible for the next three weeks. I don't know if that disappoints you or encourages you, but I just feel like honesty is the best policy. Amen? Amen. But if you really think about it, this idea of the good life and, and where we go when we hear that, maybe we go, oh, that's so cheesy, or I'm, I'm not into that, or whatever it is, or yeah, I want to read more books about that. I don't know where you're at with that, but I think it's something that we all have dealt with in our lives. And I think the, the thing, though, is as humans, our, our, our natural tendency is to look inward and to really search within ourselves and ask the question, what will make me happy? What do I want out of life? What does the good life look like as I picture it in my head? But what God calls us to in the Bible is not to look inward, but to look upward. And to say, God, you're a loving and good father. You know more than I know. What do you want for my life? What does the good life look like in your eyes, God. That's what we're going to be digging into. But since we have our kids here, I want to ask for some kid participation. I'm going to need to do a little bit of an illustration for this, I feel like, since it's like, so if you're a kid and you want to be a part of my illustration, go ahead and stand up for me. If you would. Jake, get up here, buddy. All of you guys, come on up here, kids that want to be a part of it. Forrest. You're halfway here, buddy. Come on up. <laughs> I like it. Come on, we're going to line up right here. And if you think about it, you guys line up facing the ground, spread out. Tyler, I like it. You guys, round of applause. And stand right up here. All right. So there's just some things, right? Like, if you were growing up, if you're like me, you thought, like, you know what? This is what I want to be when I grow up. Or this is what I want my life to to look like. I believe that Tyler always wanted to be a professional baseball player. <laughs> right? When he was growing up, he probably thought, I just want to be a professional baseball player. And I bet you I bet you what you thought about Jake is you always thought, you know what, I want to be a knight. <laughs> Don't hit anybody with that. <laughs> right? I bet you I bet you you always wanted to be a movie star. <laughs> be all glamorous, huh? <laughs> yeah? I feel like Forrest probably always wanted to be an engineer. <laughs> Drive a train around. Be awesome. Right? I think, I think uh, you probably wanted to be Rico Suave, right? <laughs> you got a tie, and I already tied it for you. <laughs> Put it on, buddy. 
All right? I bet you, I bet you Caleb Keating is kind of mysterious. It always wanted a magic lamp that would, would grant her three wishes. Huh? I bet you you always wanted to be a rock star. Right? I bet you always wanted a wad of cash you could do whatever you want with. Are you feeling that you always wanted to be a superhero? Did you always want to be a superhero? Looking good. Alright? Who wanted to be a doctor when they grew up? Come on, don't lie to me. Raise your hand. Who wanted to be a doctor? You did? Alright. Who wanted to be a doctor? Who wanted to be adventurous and be a scientist and figure stuff out? Alright, Kira. You got called out. Check it out. Alright? Who wanted to be a pirate? Who wanted to be a pirate? Nice. Who wanted to be a princess? Not you, I know. <laughs> I bet Stephanie always wanted to be a princess. Not really. I think my wife wanted to be a superhero, too. I got a couple more things. Who wanted to be rich and be able to afford glamorous jewelry? Huh? Are you one of our elders? We'll talk about that later, buddy. I bet you Frank always wanted to be a detective. Right? I bet you always wanted to get married one day. <laughs> and for the rest of you, your life's pretty much just empty. <laughs> Go ahead and sit down. Good job, you guys. Here, take part in the Very good. Right, silly baby, but, but the reality is, is if you're like me, and, and I would imagine you are, or the people that I've talked to, we all get ideas in our head, we say, you know what, there's, there's just, I just need this one thing to happen in order for me to be okay, right? The very next thing, I need, I need that job, right? Or I need, I need that relationship, or I need, I need that house, or I do just need a totally different new thing, and I gotta move somewhere, I gotta go on vacation, or there's so many things that just allure us, and we think, if I just had that. When I was a kid, I used to make huge lists for Christmas and say, I just need all the things on this list, and then I'll never ask for anything else ever again. I promise. Have you guys ever made that promise? And then you get some of those things, and you're so excited, and you play with them, and then they sit in the closet. Why? Because they didn't ultimately work to satisfy you deep enough. They weren't, they weren't the meaning of your life. And, and what, what we we're all drawn to do that, to look inwardly and to think, and, and, and the advertisements are huge, right? You can just watch commercials or read magazines, and they'll tell you what you need. Here's what you need. If you just had this, you'd be so much happier, and it's all lies. And yet what we're called to do is to look upwardly and to say, God, what do you want? With my life, ultimately you and you alone can satisfy me. And so in this Old Testament uh, a book called Micah, we find this, this statement in Micah 6 8. It's a popular verse in Micah 6 8 where he, where he says this. He goes, he has told you that he here is God. God has told you, O oh man, what is good. God has an idea of what the good life is. He says, God has told you what is good. And what does the Lord require of you but to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God? Now, if you were Jewish, there's a statement that you would have heard and it would have been very familiar to you. Your, your dad would have talked to you about it. Your mom would have talked to you about it. Everyone would have talked about this. And they would have said, Shema, Israel. Adonai, Elohimu. Adonai, Icha. You would have heard that. And you would have thought, that's the first thing that I learned when I was a boy sitting on my dad's lap. He would teach me that. It means, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God. The Lord is one. The very next verses, he says, You shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart and with all of your soul and with all of your strength. 
It goes on to say, you shall talk about these things with your children, with your neighbors, with everybody, not just on Sunday, but 24-7. You shall talk about these things. At the end of the passage, it says, you shall, you shall seek to do what is right in the eyes of the Lord. It says, don't turn from that. And if you do that, it says there'll be blessing. If you don't, it says there'll be consequences. Just like you would expect from a loving father. Instruction like that. Right? We tell our kids, don't do that. Why? Because we love you. And there'll be consequences. We have a loving father. If you're Jewish, you would have known that's what we should focus on. Every day in the morning, we should read the Shema, it's called. After the first letter, which means listen or hear. We would hear that. And, and, and so Israel gets sent out. This is Moses in Deuteronomy telling us this. Deuteronomy chapter 6. Israel gets set off on a good course. Right? It's like leaving church. You're like, okay, I heard a good sermon. I'm ready. And guess what? They're just all over the place. They go down and they go up. And they go down and they go up. When Micah finally gets on scene, he's a contemporary with Isaiah or Hosea, about the 8th century. Actually comes on scene about 750 B.C., right? And he's, and he's going he's gonna to be preaching or, or prophesying from about 20 miles southwest of Jerusalem to all of Israel. And what's going on is they're going up and they're going down. And the condition of Israel in the 8th century, the time of Isaiah, is such that economy is good. Like, like outwardly, they're, they're, they're able to do things like, like get married and have houses and money's okay. But inwardly, they're so far from God. And, and, and they know it. And, and there's a lot of corruption. There's political corruption. The priesthood has become corrupt. Everything has been corrupt. The, the leadership of Israel has been corrupted. So God sends these prophets. Only a hundred years later, you're going to see that the prophet Jeremiah comes on scene. And he starts saying, look, you guys are going to go into captivity. The end of 2 Chronicles, which talks about this time, it's going to say, look, you guys have gotten so far away from God inwardly that there's now no more remedy less, unless you guys get sent into exile. We know history records that they did go into exile when Daniel records that, right? When they went to Babylon. So, but it was because God loved them. There was no more remedy. It was an inward issue. And so we're going to look at this time when, 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 when Micah comes and he basically calls them out on it. He goes, look, you guys, on the outside, everything looks fine, but inwardly you know it. So far from God, so empty, things aren't good. I've been there. And they know it. And they, and, and they, and they go, okay, well, what do we do? He goes, you know what to do. Isn't it true that sometimes we just don't need more information? We don't need more knowledge. We just need to start to obey what we already know. Right? And so he, he gives these three things. And the, over three weeks we're going to be looking at this. And the first one he says, you know what? Do justice. Do justice. What does that actually mean? To do justice. Justice. Obviously, justice is kind of like a, a, a legal type term. When I think of justice, I think of like the court system, right? I think of like a judge. And that's what you see in the book of Micah. He comes, the Lord comes in Micah in the earlier chapters, and he said, He comes like a judge. He says, You guys, this is what this is what I have against you. And this is what's going to happen if you don't repent. But here's an opportunity to repent. Right? Like a good prophet. But they don't. Right? And so he gives this idea, do justice. What does it actually mean? In most simple terms, you could say it like this. What does the Lord say is good, but to do good? Right? He's saying do good. Or to do justice. One of the words that might be synonymous with justice would be righteousness. To do what's right. Do what's right. Righteous. And if you look in Scripture... And you see this from Deuteronomy chapter 6 and woven all the way through Scripture. You're going to see that there's an even bigger thread that he talks about. When he's talking about do justice, it's not just to do right. But it's to do right in the eyes of the Lord. I believe that the best way to translate this in a way that we can... When to do justice, what does that look like? To do what's right in the eyes of the Lord. Because he's the judge. He says what's just. Do what he said. Obey. Do justice. 
And we see this after Moses comes. We have a period of time called the Judges. And if you've ever read through the Judges, there's lots of weird stories in there with donkey bones and real big strong guys named Samson and, and him like going off on the wrong type of dates to prom and all kinds of bad stuff, right? And they go up and they go down. But at the end of Judges, it really gives a good picture of why that happens. In Judges 21, 25, it says, In those days there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. Not everyone did what was right in the eyes of the Lord. Big difference. But we all probably make that mistake. How many times do we just do what's right in our own eyes? Why do we do that? Well, we're human. That's why we need instruction. That's why we need the Lord. They did not do what was right in the eyes of the Lord. In Micah 1, we see a picture of the times. We see in Micah 1, 1, it says, The word of the Lord came to Micah. <clears throat> he was a prophet. It was Micah of Moresheth. That's a town that was like 22 miles southwest of Jerusalem, if you have a map. right? So he's, he's, he's a local boy. In the days of Jotham, Jotham was a king in Israel. In 750 B.C., that's when he started. In the days of Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah. So it gives you a time when Micah is writing. Which he saw concerning Samaria and Jerusalem. If you know that the, the, the kingdom at this point has divided into two kingdoms, the southern kingdom. The southern kingdom, the, uh, the capital of the southern kingdom was... Uh, was Jerusalem, and the northern kingdom was Samaria. So he's saying all of Israel at this point. That's who I'm writing to. But if you look at it, he names three kings. When you look through the history books about these kings, God views their life, and he doesn't say, how did they do based on foreign policy? How did they do based on, on any other type of policy? God gives one one decisive judgment against the king of whether they were a good king or not. And guess what it is? He goes, this is the king. He did what was right in the eyes of the Lord. Or this is the king. He did not do what was right in the eyes of the Lord. In 2 Kings 16.2 it says Ahaz. He's one of the ones mentioned here. Ahaz was 20 years old when he began to reign. He reigned 16 years in Jerusalem. That means he lived to be 36, because that's how you end your reign when you're dead. Right? And, and he did not do what was right in the eyes of the Lord, his God. Everything that he did, I don't know what he did. But I know when God looked at him, he goes, he didn't do what was right in my eyes. And then he adds this. He didn't do what was right in the eyes of the Lord as his father David had done. 2 Kings 18.3, we learn about Hezekiah, the other king that's in there. Hezekiah, and he, Hezekiah, did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, according to all that David, his father, had done. Do justice. Do what's right in the eyes of the Lord. That is really, ultimately, what is going to matter in your life. But I want to point out something interesting here. You might have noticed it. He goes, every time he goes, he goes, he did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, and then he adds something at the end. He goes, according to what his father David had done. Right? King David. Now that's interesting, and I don't know if you're like me, I've always read that, because it always comes up associated with this idea of he did what was right in the eyes of the Lord in this, in this time frame. According to how the David... That always bothered me. Because I've read the stories of what David has done. And I've always thought, well, why does he say that? David didn't always do the right thing. Actually, David went off and did the wrong thing often. David did some really really, really off things. So why does he say he did what was right in the eyes of the Lord like David did? I've come to realize that it might be the most encouraging thing in the Old Testament, those words. Because guess what? David wasn't perfect. David didn't always do what was right. He made a lot of mistakes. If we were to raise our hands and say, help you relate to that, I think all of us would be honest and raise our hands. And it's encouraging because he's saying, here, look like David did. David didn't always do what was right, but his heart always wanted to. His heart was a part after God's own heart. He wanted to do, he wanted to please God. 
When he didn't please God, he would always come back to this time of, of, of being brokenhearted and repent and want to get back with God. God, when we say do justice, perhaps it means a lot more than just be perfect. It can't mean that. It means, it means something more. I want to dig into that today. And I want to look at three things we see in the scripture. What does it look like to do what's right in the eyes of the Lord, scripturally? And number one in your notes is this. This involves your attitude. Do what's right in the eyes of the Lord with your attitude. How many of you guys know this? Why you do what you do is incredibly important. There's a lot of people who, 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 who do good things. Right? But, but, but what's really important to God is why you do good things. Israel, in the time Micah writes, is doing good things. The temple is still intact. They're still going to church. They're still reading some scripture. They're still doing the rituals. They're still having the feasts. They're still going through the motions of being God's people. But their hearts are far from God. There's much corruption that has come. It's not enough to just do good things. It's not enough to just go and love people and do the love dare. Why you do what you do is incredibly important to God. In Micah 6, 7, I mean 6, 6 and 6, 7, this is right before our text. Basically, in, in, in chapter 6, he goes like this. God reminds them, look at all that I've done for you. Look how much I love you. God loves you. He's done so much for you. And then they're going to say, well, what do we need to do, right, to make things right? And they go, what shall I, shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before God on high? Is it enough to just come and raise your hands? That's what it would look like. Shall I come before him with burnt offerings? Shall I bring a sacrifice? Shall I just do something? Do I do, do, do? what good act do I need to do to counterbalance all the, all the, all the mess I've made? And with calves a year old, will the Lord be pleased with a thousand rams, with ten thousand of rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? Is there something that I can just do externally to make things right? They're totally missing the point. Right? Don't just make a huge donation and then go off in your business practice practices are completely unaffected. How you act in your neighborhood is completely unaffected. Well, yeah, but I went to ShareFest and did this great thing. Well, that's great. Or I went to that widow's house and I did that great thing. Yeah, okay, awesome. But is your heart, is your attitude getting aligned with God? So we see God never asked them, never asked us to give our firstborn son. Why would they say that? It might be that it's a little bit prophetic. It's not that I want you to give your firstborn son, but I am going to give my son Jesus. Jesus is going to come. He's going to die for the transgressions, for the sin. It's as if we see this, this, this important distinguishing reality that we don't do good in order to be saved. There's nothing that you can do to be right with God. There's nothing that you can do to be saved. But we do good, why? We, do, we don't do good to be saved. We do good because we've been saved. It's a heart. We love God because He first loved us. It never is the other way around. We don't just start loving God. When we realize how much He loves us. We, and that's what Mike is trying to call them to do. Remember how much God loves you. Let that stir your heart and motivate you to want to do justice. To want to start to do what's right in the eyes of the Lord. So why you do is incredibly important. This could be, this could be kind of synonymous with another thing that we see in scriptures when he says, Love the Lord your God with all your heart. The Shema. Jesus quotes it in Luke. 
He says, what's the most important commandment? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with your attitude, with your desire. You want to do what's right in the eyes of the Lord. So the last thing in your notes in and, and this section is this. Do you desire to do what is right in the eyes of the Lord? Do you desire to do what is right in the eyes of the Lord? David desired to do what is right in the eyes of the Lord. When he got off track, he, he, would, he would repent and get back on track. If you desire to do what is right in the eyes of the Lord. So your attitude is one aspect of this. The second one, though, is this. Your intellect. Your intellect. Do you desire to do what's right in the eyes of the Lord with your mind, with your intellect? What we're basically saying at this point is this. God is the judge of what is good. What is the good life? Well, if, if God is the judge of what is good, then of course we would look to Him and say, God, what is good? And what do you require of me? To do good, to do what's right in my eyes. Your intellect. In Micah 3, 1 and 2, he says this, he goes, Shema, hear, you heads of Jacob and rulers of the house of Israel. Is it not for you to know justice? You're supposed to know what's right. You're the leaders. He says, you who hate the good and love the evil. This is describing a people who, who, who know what God thinks is good, but they think, I know better than God. They say, what you say is good, I think is evil. I don't think it's good. And, and the things that I think are, are good, you say is evil. Well, I don't think they're evil. I think they're fine. But if God is the judge and we're submitting ourselves to that, to do justice is to say God is always right. Psalm 119, 160 says, The sum of your word is truth. All, if we did a math equation, everything that you say is true. And every one of your righteous rules endures forever. It will never change. Right? The, the times change, the cultures change, but God's word never changes and it's always true. That's what it looks like to do justice. To have that mind set that God is right. I want to be biblical. And what this looks like is, is to love the Lord your God with all of your mind. To love the Lord with your God with all of your mind is to say, God, you are smart, right? You're smarter than me. Like it says in Proverbs, it says, lean not on your own understanding, but in all of your ways, acknowledge Him, and He will make your path straight. That's a submission. Okay, I don't understand why you're doing what you're doing right now, God, but I trust you. I don't know why your word says to do this, but, but I know these people that, 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 that are over here, and it just doesn't make, there's, it doesn't make sense to me. I don't know why you say this, but you're, you know more than me. To love the Lord your God with all of your mind and to do justice are synonymous. Do you submit yourself to God's word? Have you submitted yourself to God's word? Because that is part of doing what's right in God's eyes. And lastly, we see with your actions. This is typically what we would think about, but we don't start there on purpose, right? Do justice is an action, right? You don't just imagine if, if, if you told your kids and you said, hey, clean your room. Got it. You do got it? Because I just said clean your room. Got it. You still play a video game, right? You come back an hour later, and you go, hey, I walked by your room, I noticed it wasn't clean. Did you hear me? I heard you. <laughs> it's not good enough to just hear me. I want you to do it. Here's something interesting. The word Shema, which is all throughout the, the, the Old Testament, it's a Hebrew word. The word Shema, it, it's translated hear or listen. But it doesn't just mean to perceive sound. That's how we use it. To listen or to hear is not just to perceive sound. Shema means literally to listen with the intent of obeying. To listen with the intent of obeying. So, so with your kid, you go, hey, did you hear? Yeah, I heard what you said. You said clean your room. Did you shema? <laughs> uh, 
Okay, I get it. Now I need to get up and actually do something. What if we read our Bibles like that? What if we read our Bibles like we wanted to hear from God? The desire, the attitude was, I want to know what you want me to do. What if we read our Bibles like, like, God, what you say is true and I need to know what's true. I want to listen with the intent of obeying. And then we lived our lives obeying Scripture. All of that encompassed and nothing short of that is what he's saying in Micah 6.8, to do justice, to do what's right in my eyes. In your notes, we see that God's will is, is for us to do good. It is God's will for you to do good. When we look at this idea of do justice, many people think of, of, of like what we call social justice, and they say to do good is to, is to, like to take care of the poor and, and the widow and the orphan and those who are neglected and, 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 and the sojourner. All of that is encompassed in this. Because all of those things, the Bible says, are right in the eyes of the Lord. But it shouldn't stop there. To do justice is yes to do that, but it's also to just do the right thing as God sees it. As best we can in our desire. What this leads you to is when you don't do it, you feel distant from God, and it leads you to a good repentance that wants, wants to get back with God. It's a, it's a do justice. Ephesians 2.10 says, For we are his workmanship. We are his poems, it says. We're his artwork. Created in Christ Jesus for good works. He created us for good works. Which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Right? We're supposed to walk in the good works that God has for us. How this would look like is, let's stop telling our kids, Hey, you can be whatever you want to be when you grow up. You just work hard enough. I know it sounds awesome, but it is not true, and it's not honoring to the Lord. You can do whatever you want to do when you grow up. What are we feeding? Look inwardly to yourself and try to figure out what you think is going to make you happy. But where do we start? No, look upward and say, God, what do you want for my life? Kids, don't want to do whatever you want to do. Want to do what He wants you to do. It's way better. Want to do what he wants you to do. It's way better. Do justice. Want to do what God wants to do. Give your life to God. Let God have your life. Do what he wants you to do. I'm telling you, Deuteronomy 6 was true. It will lead to blessing. This is synonymous with what we hear Jesus saying is the greatest commandment to love the Lord your God with all your strength. To love the Lord your God with all your strength. To do what He wants you to do. With everything you have. I want to walk into heaven. I don't know about you, but I want to walk into heaven with a black eye. And like a limp. Right? I don't want to get there and be like, oh, I'm well rested, God. I'm ready to worship you. I, I just took a whole break for like the last 15 years. I didn't do anything. Just get ready. Right? I want to walk in with a limp and, and maybe a missing limb and a, and a black eye. And I want to fall at Jesus' feet. I gave everything. And I want to hear him say, well done. Have him touch me and restore me to my new body. And, and live out the rest of my life knowing I did what was right in the eyes of the Lord. With my attitude, with my mind, and with my strength. <laughs> Lastly, are you obedient to what God, to what you know God has said? Jesus says this. He goes, in John 14, 15, he goes, if you love me, if you love me, what, what, what if you love me, God? If you love me, you will keep my commandments. If you love me, you will shema. If you love me, you won't just go, yeah, God, I, remember, I memorized a bunch of scripture. I heard what you said, Mom. Right? Clean your room. We do that with God, don't we? Oh, yeah, God, I know what you said, right? Yeah, I got, I got a bunch of scriptures memorized. I know lots of stuff you said. Okay, but like two years later, I come in and I go, okay, well, did you hear or did you shema? Are you making disciples? Because I said that. And I, and I want you to actually go do it. Right? Are you loving? Are you loving? Are, are you loving God? Are you loving others? And here's the thing. I, I, there's a temptation with all of the knowledge that is available to us today to think, you know what we need? We need to, we need to get into more Bible study, which is awesome. 
if it's intended to lead to action, to, to obedience. But, but we, we tend to think, like, I need to know more stuff. Maybe that's if I knew, I knew more stuff. Most of us know enough stuff to start. But the real issue is we're not doing what we already know. Are, 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 you, are you doing what you know God wants you to do? And in those areas where you need wisdom, like, I don't know what comes next, are you seeking it? Well, God, my heart is for you. I want to know what you, I know, I want to know what you have for me next. Are you obedient to what you know God has said? We're going to get into a worship now. As we do that, what, what has God been saying to you this morning? What are, what have you heard? What have you heard God saying to you this morning? My challenge is to not just hear it, but Shema, O Israel. Adonai Elohim. Adonai Echad. 